Uh, and we will draw on this a little bit further down the track, Mr Speaker, around medical assessments. I call the honourable member, Dr Rajin Prasad. No, uh, I talk no Master. Talking to part one of this bill, which really contains the nub of the government's arguments and, and the, the, the bulk of the provisions that this side of the House has major difficulties with, Mr Chairman. And uh, it, it, when I considered those sanctions in particular and, and what, what part one does, then one has to start asking some very, very deliberate questions about the morality and the ethics of this approach to the most vulnerable in our society. Because this minister and this government has taken a particularly punitive approach in the provisions in part one of this bill. And it is trying to couch that in the language of caring and in the language of backing these uh, our most vulnerable. But in fact, that does, doesn't wash any water, uh, doesn't wash with us at all, Mr Chairman. Because underneath that, what this minister and this bill produces is a far more complex system and a far, far more hoops for our vulnerable to go through just to get enough resources to live by until their situation improves. And I think, Mr Chairman, though that, that's, that's the, that's the centre of our criticism of this particular approach, the ethics and the morality uh, that are contained in these particular provisions. Because the government had other ways of doing this. I mean, there are. The, these are the people who are excluded in our society, by and large. And what the government is doing with the social sanctions, are excluding them even more from participating in our society, preparing for, for work in our society, and preparing to lead their lives. And I, that, that uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, is objectionable, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's objectionable to us, uh, and, 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 and again, ethically and morally, it has got holes in it. And it's also worrying, uh, Mr. Chairman, how did we get to this point? How did this minister make the argument, how did this government make the argument that this is what society needed? Because there certainly is no big savings from the bottom line of the, of the government's budget in these provisions. I think it makes about a $20 million difference in the initial period, in, 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 their, in, in their budgets. So it doesn't save a lot of money. There is this promise that members opposite the ministers talked about, that indeed in time it will produce great wealth for our society, because it won't. And again, how much are we prepared to put our vulnerable through to get to that to, to, to get to receiving the kind of assistance that our decent society ought to be giving to our most vulnerable, Mr Chairman. So the government started by overstating the case for dependency. The government has a view against those who rely on, on benefits uh, for, for a period of time. Uh, but so by overstating the case, designing their, the task forces to look at uh, de dependency regime, it actually overstates it. It overstates welfare dependency to such an extent that it has created in our society this, this huge problem, which the provisions of Part 1 are now designed to help us get over. So, Mr Chairman, that, that, that case of dependency has not been made. Yes, there are cases. Yes, there are a small number of cases of, of those who have gamed the system. But as many people in this House know, there are many, many, many more cases of people accessing the resources and the services provided under our benefit system that have actually given them the, the opportunity to get ahead with their lives, to look after their children and to become great citizens of our society. There are many, many more examples of that. And yet, by overstating the case, we develop a punitive system. And that's, again, the provisions of Part 1 really talk about. It's, they, are, they are punitive. And there will be, I predict over time, there will be a whole army of people in work and income who will design a whole series of steps to, to monitor 
the small group of people who will learn even harder ways, even more entrenched ways of gaming the system. And that's where the game will be played out. And the most vulnerable will be caught in that. And if the government wanted to be sincere about addressing the needs of our most vulnerable, then it would actually develop a far more, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I call the Honourable Doctor a, a far Roger more productive, a productive approach to what it considers to be the need to provide for our most vulnerable a pathway out of welfare into work and, and, and preparing for, for, uh, for life uh, uh, independent of assistance for the, from, from the case, uh, from the state. Now, the, 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 the other thing that this, the provision of this bill does, it actually, it actually underplays, underplays <coughs> the, the complexities of our modern world and the complexities of what our vulnerable have to go through. Uh, it, life is not easy for many of these mums, in particular, bringing up children. And, and on, on top of that, what some of the sanctions do is actually sort of make that life for them that much harder. You know, uh, once, once children arrive in families, once children are there, there is not much point in being moralistic about how they got there. There are mums and dads that are having to bring up these children and provide the best example possible. And yet what we find, for, for those who, who, who rely on assistance from the state in, in doing that job, which is a service to our society, I mean, these are our children. There are many leaders of our society who started life as, as dependents on the state, as, as parents of, uh, of, uh, of children of sole parents. So, so, you know, we, we, we ought to be supporting them better, but the provisions of, of part, uh, part one of this bill will actually make it more difficult for them. So that uh, by age three, even if they were the best people in the world to provide care for their children between three and five, what this bill says, you're not allowed to do that. You've got to be work ready. You can't do it on a full-time basis. You've got to go out and find at least a, a certain number of hours of work because that is good for you. If you happen to be living in a couple where you're not dependent on the state, you have all of the rights in the world to bring up your children in that way. But the provisions of part one of this bill, when it comes to those sanctions around the compulsory use of, ch of, ch of childcare, actually does travesty to that right that parents ought to have. We don't give up our rights to bring up our children in the way we want to, provided it meets certain basic standards because the state tells us to do something else. Now, so there is a, an absolute nanny state type of uh, uh, flavor to the provisions in this particular bill. And, 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 and I object to this personally. I know many of the people who have relied on the state to bring up children, and I object to this, this notion of, of tarring them all with the same brush because some have not, uh, uh, th there are some cases of those who might not have used the resources particularly well. So, but life is complex enough for these families, and yet they, these provisions will make it even more, more uh, difficult for them. So what, uh, what are provisions of part one actually addressing? They're addressing some kind of bigotry that does exist in our society towards this group. And you hear talkback shows and talkback hosts, particularly in Auckland, uh, kind of pump this up all of the time, that here we are, these are the people who are taking away from us as, as taxpayers you know, uh, our, our wealth, so to speak, and therefore we must be punished. And we know enough from history, the pattern will repeat itself, because this is a punitive approach. This enables us to be, uh, uh, to, to be negative towards our neighbours because they, are, they draw their income from some other place. And to then, then impose that on, on the most vulnerable Mr. Chairman, I think is what, uh, is, is what is most objectionable uh, in, this particular bill, in this particular bill and the provision of this particular part, because we do know that if we did give them a, a decent opportunity to get started in life, things would be better. And, and the, I'm convinced myself, uh, Mr. Chairman, that there are enough provisions in the social security system at the moment to use a different approach, a spro a spro uh, an approach that encourages people to prepare for work, to, 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 uh, to meet their childcare responsibilities, 
to be guided to the extent that they need to be guided to provide the best environment. And yet, here we are, we are malign a whole group of people, and we first we malign them, then we subject them to denigration, we then call them bludgers, and we, then we put in place a punitive system. And later on in the calls, I will take, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will talk more about those who we respect in our society, who have come to the Select Committee and, and very, very uh, unequivocally said this is not the way to do things. Because by doing it this particular way, it will, we will create an even worse environment down the road. Unless, unless governments only think of, of, of just a short period of time, then Mr. Chairman will come back and talk about those kinds of, uh, of provisions of this procedure. Um, I call the Honourable Member